Hello, my name is Angela. This video is being produced on behalf of Merseyside Revival Trust. I'm going to introduce to you Jeff Green, who's written a number of booklets on the topic of God working in Merseyside and Chester, uh, which he's been doing since 2005. And as you'll see, we're here at the side of Woodside Ferry overlooking the Mersey and Liverpool. So we're right on the site that he's written about. And we're going to ask him what motivated him to write these booklets and what the purpose is of him writing about these events which happened a long time ago. So Jeff, many Christians the world over are aware of what God did in the Welsh Revival uh, with Evan Roberts and with the Wesleyan Revival with John Wesley and others and in the Hebridean Revival with Duncan Campbell. Everyone knows about it, but now, um, is it true that God has done amazing things in Merseyside? Uh, if so, could you tell us about them and what you've written about them and what really motivated you? Thanks, Angela. It, it, it is true, many people are aware of some of these great revivals that have uh, taken place in our own country, such as those you just mentioned, but um, and particularly people in the Merseyside, Chester area. But not many people, unfortunately, are aware of what God has actually done in our own region, um, because he's, actually, he's done some actually tremendous things in our, in our past history. Uh, he's raised up some amazing people, uh, going back 300 years or more, uh, back to the time of people like Wesley and um, uh, Matthew Henry, even before that. So, what I've done, I've written a series of four booklets entitled "God Working in Merseyside," uh, giving an account of uh, these some of these things that God has done in our own region. And um, I've also written some other books uh, uh, in connection with those, such as more detailed biographies of some of these people I've written about. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, as to why I've written these booklets, I think that the simple answer to that is that um, is because even though I don't consider myself to be a, a particularly uh, brilliant writer by any means, but the reason I've done, to, I've done so simply is because nobody else has. <laughs> uh, some years ago, I was in a Christian bookshop and I spoke to the manager of, of the shop and I said, could you uh, give me any information about what God has done in our own locality in Merseyside and so on, Chester? And I was, I was fully expecting him to refer me to maybe two or three books or booklets about, about all these things and all I got was a, a blank expression as though he didn't know what I was talking about. And, and I, I, I have to say I, I was really amazed because that was not what I was expecting. So I, I thought about it and I thought, well, if nobody else has done it, uh, why not do it myself? It may be far from perfect, but it's better to have something than nothing. And, and so 10 years ago, I, I, I set about undertaking that task of writing about uh, these things. And um, I, I have to say that as I've undertaken more and more research, I, I have really been amazed at uh, the extent to which God has actually blessed our region in ways I never imagined. So it's, it really has been a privilege to write about these things. And uh, also, I, I've personally been greatly blessed and inspired by some of these some of these great events in the past and my, my hope is that these booklets will also be a real blessing and inspiration to uh, other people in our own region who who, uh, who read about these things the first book in the series is entitled the Liverpool Revival in 1934. Could you tell us about this? This booklet is about um, some crusades that were taken by a man by the name of Edward Jeffreys in 1934. Now, Edward Jeffreys was the son of Stephen Jeffreys and the nephew of George Jeffreys, two brothers. And these two men were converted in the Welsh Revival and <coughs> I would say they're probably amongst the most prominent people who came, who were converted at that uh, great revival. 
and they were both very anointed and powerful evangelists and they got used them around the country with huge crusades and with many many converts. I believe Evan Roberts said he considered them to be the, the greatest uh, uh, products of the of the Welsh Revival and somebody actually said once that uh, the, the two brothers were probably the most powerful evangelists since the time of Wesley and Whitfield so that gives an indication of what these guys were like and something of that evangelistic fervor was also uh, passed on to Edward and he he followed in their footsteps he took some very powerful crusades around the country and as a result of that he formed something called the, ben the Bethel Evangelistic Society and in 1934, uh, he was a man who knew the voice of the Lord. He, God spoke to him they should come to Liverpool. And he didn't consult with anybody beforehand. Uh, he just, and had he done so, I don't think it would have been a good idea because uh, there, was, there was actually some opposition to this, these crusades. And um, so anyway, he came because God told him. And he came not with a huge team of people. He came with just two helpers. Uh, and there's a picture coming up now on the screen of uh, Edward with his two helpers, Horace Trembath and Isaiah Davis. So these, these three guys came in 1934 and they came with a three, uh, uh, tent seating 3,000 people and they put a small advert in the Liverpool paper and issued a few handbills. Some people may say that was woefully inadequate preparation, but you see, his, his reliance was not on human resources, his reliance was on God's resources. And I believe that's why God blessed these crusades and the, the, the phenomenal way in which he did. So, along he came and he started the meetings, I believe at the 28th of May 1934. The first two weeks were fairly quiet, although Quite a number of people were converted and there were some uh, quite outstanding healings including one person who was, uh, who was blind, who got, uh, was healed at that, uh, in those meetings. But towards the end of the second week something phenomenal began to happen uh, and the press got to hear about it. Now this in a way is similar to the Welsh, Cruc the Welsh revival because uh, anybody who knows the story of that revival will know that uh, Evan Roberts held these meetings in Moriah Chapel in uh, Alucca in South Wales and as things began to happen it came to the uh, the knowledge of the press and the press sent somebody there next thing in there was a report in the paper and uh, then the crowds really began to come and God began to move in a, in a wonderful way and that's exactly what happened in Bootle also um, the uh, papers came and they, it wasn't just inside pages, it was headlined uh, about the uh, great things, amazing things happening at the tent in Bootle. And um, as time went on, after three weeks there was no less than 10,000 people or more coming to these meetings and the power of God was being manifested in, in such a, a phenomenal way that Edward Jeffreys realized after a while that it was out of his hands, God was at work and um, he, even, even during the, all that God was doing he, he actually went on a holiday because he was so confident that God was at work that he, he went on holiday because he needed the rest, it was a great strain on him. So. Um, after three weeks or so, the 19th of June, there was no less than 3,000 people converted in one day. And that is really a sort of results we had on the day of Pentecost. <laughs> uh, it's actually the Apostles' uh, experience. And, you know, I've spoken to a number of people, maybe nine people altogether, who actually are present in those meetings. And of course they were very young at the time, because it was 90, 80 years ago. But each one of them said those crusades impacted them away, which uh, left a mark on their life for the rest of their life, you know. And um, amongst that, there's people that I spoke to were uh, two sisters, and I met them one day, and they told me that when they were children, they used to walk along a particular street to uh, go to school, and 
uh, in one of those houses they they put this little girl, handicapped girl, was in a bath chair up against the window so she, she could wave to the people going by. And uh, this happened for quite a while. Anyway, these two sisters, when they were children, they went into the tent crusade and they couldn't believe what they had witnessed. This little girl who they saw each day propped up in the window had been healed and she was running around the tent. And they were the sort of phenomenal things that uh, were happening. One of the persons also told me that so many people were healed, uh, disabled people, that they discarded their crutches, their wheelchairs, their bath chairs, and every, every now and again a van used to come and collect all these discarded items, and that was just r really amazing. Now, as I say, they all commented about the revival atmosphere that existed in those tents, and what I'd like to do is just read a uh, comment by a lady by the name of Arona Williams and this gives you an idea what it was like in those meetings. She, this happened two days before the day when 3,000 people got converted. She said, We felt that we were truly in the tabernacle of God. A holy awe fell on the tent and it seemed that we were standing on holy ground. All we could do was just bow our heads and worship the Lord. Her impression of the evening service was given as follows. What an atmosphere, what a congregation, what singing, what testimonies. The gospel tent was again packed and yet people streamed in from all directions to hear the story of redeeming love. Many, many hundreds were obliged to stand outside. At the close of the address an invitation was given for people to take Christ into their lives. Unless one was an eyewitness, it is difficult to visualise a scene. All over the tent, men and women stood to their feet and hundreds of hands were raised by those standing around. The number was far, far too many to count. What a glorious sight. Multitudes coming into the Kingdom of God. Probably about 1,500 people. But it is too difficult to estimate such a vast number. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Praise God for such a wonderful testimony. Now, in, in every revival, it's not just a matter of lots of people coming, getting saved. But it, it's also, they would also have, have some effect on the town. And such an effect was uh, experienced in Bootle, and the tent was later moved to um, to uh, Chubrook. Uh, oh, by the way, they, they had to increase the size of the tent to 5,000, and but even that was woefully inadequate. Now, this is what uh, Reverend W. R. Jones uh, wrote about the far-reaching influence that the Crusades had on the social and religious life. Uh, he referred to the wonderful grip it had on men and women who rarely heard the story of Christ and his redeeming love, uh, to the complete and marvellous change in the conversation of men and women and young people everywhere in the trams, buses, office and workshops. The topic of conversation was not gambling as it used to be, but of the saving power of Christ, not of the fashion of time, but of eternal realities. Another minister, Reverend Maddock, made the remark that the dire need of those days was a revival which would change lives and homes and bring a blessed atmosphere of God into business places, dockside and even the cemetery amongst the grave diggers. And that it was such a revival that was witnessed at Chubrook and Bootle. One white eyewitness of the effects of the crusade of the life of the town made the remark that every backyard rang with the praises of God. So we praise the Lord for such a wonderful uh, revival that's happened here in Liverpool. Some people say that Liverpool is a really tough place, Merseyside is a tough place, but you know uh, what I say is God has done it before and all these wonderful things that happened in, in Bootle, Chubrook, all those years ago, he's the same God, he's the same yesterday and today and forever and I believe he's able to do those same things again today. The second book is entitled Revivals and Other Great Events. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> and this it covers some of the other great moves of God uh, over the last couple of hundred years or so. And one of those is the a crusade taken by D.L. Moody. Now, he was a very powerful evangelist in the 19th century whom God used up and down the land. <clears throat> and he was invited here in 1875 by a group of uh, very wealthy businessmen 
they got together, they formed a committee and they decided to invite him and as I say he came in 1875 and what they did, they purchased a temporary building and they put it in uh, a piece of wasteland in Victoria Street now you see the picture coming up now, this is, will be recognised by most people it's actually the council park at, uh, um, <coughs> in Victoria Street and it's, even, it's, it's always been a waste piece of land ever since that crusade was held. Anyway, uh, this building was uh, designed to accommodate about 8,000 people. Now, the next picture coming up is a building very similar to it, and that, that gives you an idea of the type of building it was. Now, as I say, it, it was designed to accommodate 8,000 people, but the natural fact it accommodated a lot more than that, 10,000 or more. They didn't have the same health and safety concerns than they do have now. And you know, the crusade was about a month in duration, and I would say that virtually every meeting was packed to capacity with. Often, a lot of people couldn't get into those meetings. So God's blessing was very much on that crusade. And I think one of the important factors was that, that um, they had prayer meetings each day at midday, and, you know, usually in these sort of events you'll get a s small handful of people who will pray, but that wasn't the case then. There were th literally thousands of people. They came together crying out to God for God's blessing on that crusade. And God doesn't disappoint. There was, uh, there was a tremendous move of God. Something like four to 500 converts every meeting. And, um, you know, it, the effect on Liverpool was quite dramatic, that, particularly in the city centre. Uh, it was a talk of all the business community. Every day people were talking about what God was doing in this crusade. And also, at that time, there were two or three uh, papers being issued in, in Liverpool, and they were based in the city centre. Uh, with it being so close, they sent reporters, and it was uh, well covered by the press. And <clears throat> it was actually headline stuff every day. That was the, the impact it had. That, so that was a very, very powerful crusade. Now, the amazing thing about it is that Moody, although God used him very powerfully, the man was really, he was not a great orator. He was just an ordinary man. But he was somebody who God took hold of. He could be, he had, the important thing was he had God's anointing on him. And God just took hold of him and used him really powerfully. So there were thousands and thousands of people uh, brought to Christ through that crusade. What I'd like to do is actually read <coughs> a comment made by a Liverpool MP by the name of Samuel Smith, who was a very fine Christian and he was on the committee that invited Moody. And this, this is what he said. It has never been my lot to see so vast a crowd so deeply moved as those that filled the Victoria Hall night after night for more than a month. I have often listened to the eloquence of Gladstone and sometimes of John Bryce, but neither of these orators could hold eight to 10,000 people night after night spellbound as Mr. Moody did. And strange to say, he had no grace, graces of eloquence, but an uncouth manner and an unmusical voice, and not a few Yankee mannerisms. But the evident sincerity, the tremendous earnestness, and the wondrous knowledge of the human heart and of God's remedy for sin made Mr. Moody's appeals irresistible. So we thank God that was a very powerful move of God and here in Liverpool. <coughs> Another one I'd like to refer to is one taken by a Liverpool businessman. Uh, he was a solicitor. He was a layman at the time of his death, but he was a man, even though he wasn't a great speaker by any means. And yes, God's hand was upon him, and he, he had a tremendous anointing on his ministry. And God used him in revival power uh, <coughs> up and down the land and even on the continent. It was said he was a chief human instrument that God used in the Aberdeen revival with many thousands of brought to the kingdom. So this was a, a real powerful guy. But in 1855, God laid it on his heart to uh, hire a building that used to be there called the Teutonic Hall, later the St. James's Hall. Now that was in Lime Street. Now you see the picture coming up on the screen now. That shows the approximate lo location. Uh, it was just on the other side of the road from Lime Street Station, just to the left. So you can see where that uh, <coughs> hall was located then. 
And so the, the idea was they were going to have uh, meetings at half hour intervals every Sunday. And before that, they had a very t uh, intense time of prayer and intercession right throughout the night. And prayer, as I've often found in all these moves of God and in every revival, prayer is always the key factor. And what I'd like to read is something which his wife, a comment his wife made about this on this very subject. The watchword that sounded forth in those days was prayer. Praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. It was another Pentecost, she said. The children of God waited, but with unceasing and united prayer for the promise. And its fulfilment came in manifested power from on high, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So, as I say, there was a huge amount of prayer went, and they, they trusted God to break in. And they were quite nervous on the first day, wondering whether the hall would be filled or not. And they came under a lot of criticism for the Christians. They didn't think it was a really good idea. It sounds very familiar. And, um, but anyway, they started the meetings at 10 o'clock. And by 12 o'clock, God really broke through. The heavens were rent. And God came in with tremendous power. People were crying out to God for mercy. And so many, they had to be moved into a separate room. There was a team of evangelists. They, uh, they went out to different parts of the town. They held open air meetings and invited people to these meetings. And they, uh, they led processions of people singing at the top of voices, praises to God. And they came into the hall, causing total disruption. But God was at work. And uh, there, there, there were many, many people brought to the Lord. Now, that Jane Ratcliffe, I believe it was, wrote in this way about the, those meetings. And this sums up what it was like. Never was a more glorious sight than when those bands came marching in, their voices peening over the town and praises to God. Prostitutes and drunkards broken under the mighty power of God were brought along with each company, all of which, joining at Lime Street, sang and filled the hall and streets. Jane Ratcliffe observed, never could those present forget the solemn effect of this. It was, it was a scene never to be forgotten as poor fallen women came from the dismal neighbourhood of Stanley Street to Thomas Buildings and Victoria Street, then a mass of tumble-down buildings, pigsties and haunts of vice. In they marched with shawls over their heads, dishevelled locks and burning cheeks, down which their tears were dropping. Preachers now began to address the people all around. Souls were crying out all day, some springing into liberty. Rich and poor alike were brought under the power of the gospel. Ladies in silk, silk and satin dresses huddled up with poor ragged girls, men wearing gold chains and thieves down, on the knees together, imploring pardons for their sins until midnight. Prior to that, somebody had a dream, and in the dream they saw rivers of water flowing through the city centre, and in the dream the, the, the word came, this is revival. And that was just before those meetings, and a real powerful move of God uh, broke out in, that, uh, in those meetings. So that's two of the uh, revivals I've written about in that booklet. So far, everything you've told us has happened in Liverpool. What about the Wirral? Can you tell us anything about what God has done here? Yes, he has indeed uh, done many wonderful things. Uh, in the 1859 revival, which affected many parts of the country, as well as uh, Wales, Ireland, both north and south, uh, <coughs> Liverpool was uh, very much part of uh, centre of that revival and uh, at, at times many meetings were held at the same time and uh, one of them was in a building called Hope Hall which picture is now coming up. A, a lot of people will recognise it, it's now the Everyman Theatre. So it's good to know that that building was actually uh, part of a revival many many years ago. But the revival also affected different parts of the world. One of, the, one of those areas was uh, Bromapool Village and a real move of God took place then. In that same village, later on, uh, with the Price's Candle Factory, they had the owners were the uh, two brothers, the Wilson brothers, and one of them was a fervent evangelical, and he had a real passion for the conversion of his workforce, and many of them were brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord through his, through his uh, speaking to them. 
and as as they all lived in the village they they after a while they asked him whether they could build them a church for them and uh, that's exactly what he did and that church is still still there today you can see this picture of Bumperpool village you can see the church uh, St Matthew's church that's still still there and open today in 1860, there was a real move of God in Clawton Village. A young man by the name of William Lockhart, he was only about 21 years of age. He was a well-known cricketer, actually, also. And God used him to bring a, a real move of God there. And he, he, he wrote in his diary about a great awakening had taken place in, in Clawton Village. Uh, in 1905, there were some real powerful moves of God also. Um, they... Torrey and Alexander, they, they, they came around about that time and they did a number of crusades in Liverpool and the world. And one meeting they took was in Port Sunlight in Hume Hall. And Mr Lever closed the factory and he has had all his workforce come into this meeting, so it was filled to thousands of people. And although there wasn't a great response to the invitation, um, something happened which brought a real move of God uh, in that area, Port Sunlight, New Ferry, and particularly Rock Ferry. And God moved in a very powerful way. And this was not the secular press, re, re, sorry, the Christian press are reporting this. It was, it was the secular press, the Birkenhead News, carried weekly reports about what God was doing in Rock Ferry. And one of the places where God moved very powerfully was in St. Paul's Road Mission, where we are today. And you can see the picture outside. This building has... Um, still has a church each week, uh, functioning each week, and it's also used for a number of the Christ Christian activities, including Flame Radio, which many people are aware of in the Merseyside. Uh, also at that time, um, during the middle of the Welsh revival, Evan Roberts, he had it laid on his heart to come to Merseyside, he believed God called him here. And he took a number of meetings in Liverpool and also in the Wirral, uh, including two meetings in Birkenhead. And as a result of those meetings, a, a new uh, church was was formed and built. And you can see the picture of it now. It's in Lead Street in, in Birkenhead. And, you know, the Welsh Revival was, had tremendous press, press coverage. Uh, you know, if you look at the papers at that time, there were, it was headline stuff every day. And virtually everybody knew about what was going on. And so when he came to Birkenhead, one of the first meeting. There was three three churches uh, uh, nominated where he he, was, he may he may speak, and you know when when he came, every one of those buildings was packed to capacity, <laughs> and with huge crowds outside, and the, and the one that was eventually chosen was the Primitive Methodist Church in Grange Road, which is where Iceland is now, and it was right opposite Grange Baptist Church, which was then in Grange Road, so that was another uh, great move of God. So yes, he sent some. Great things in Wirral also. And what about Chester? It's been said that the Welsh revival stopped when it got as far as Chester. So have there been any great moves of God in Chester? Yes, I have indeed. Um, it is true what you said, but I think part of the reason for that maybe is because it was the Welsh revival was mainly uh, affected Welsh-speaking people, but. It, it was affected by other great revivals, uh, such as the 1859 revival. Chester was also very much uh, affected by that great revival. Um, prior to that, it was very much affected by the Methodist revival, with the frequent visits of John Wesley to Chester, something like 30, 30 visits during the course of his ministry over nearly 40 years. And um, that was, well, we all know that the... The, the Methodist revival, sometimes known as the Second Great Awakening, and that, that affected many parts of the country, and Chester was uh, very powerfully affected by that revival, as well as Liverpool, of course. And um, <clears throat> as I say, John Wesley came here uh, 30 times. And, you know, the Methodist church was not formed, actually, until after his death. So at that time, People used to go to the normal meetings on, on Sundays and uh, that the Methodist meetings were held at other times of the week, usually at five o'clock in the morning where they'd have prayer meetings or Bible studies. And um, 
Nowadays, maybe people wouldn't be so enthusiastic about attending meetings at that time, but then they did. It was huge enthusiasm and uh, vast crowds used to, to attend his meetings. And such as the, uh, the enthusiasm that um, one, one young lady, she travelled uh, from Neston to get to those meetings. That was 11 miles, so she'd travel 11 miles to get to the 5 o'clock meeting. So that, I think, is a real example to us today, you know, the sort of commitment they had. Um, so, yes, a, a real powerful work was done through the Methodist revival. Prior to that, of course, there was the ministry of Matthew Henry. Uh, he's, he was in Chester for 25 years, a very uh, a great ministry uh, under, under that man. And he actually married a, a girl from Bromborough, quite close to where I used to live. So I thought that that's quite interesting. Um, but I think one of the most powerful moves actually was in the, the 1880s uh, under the Salvation Army. There's a young lady by the name of Marion Falconbridge, who later Marion Pawson. She came to Chester and she was a, what I would describe a fearless warrior for Christ. And God mightily used her. And at one time she actually came within a, uh, an inch of losing her life because as she led one of the processions through Chester, they were, they were stoned and she was very, very badly injured. But, but God raised her up and um, she had the nickname, the Zulu Queen. And uh, it's, I'm just, you'll see coming on the screen now is a, a book that was written about her life under that title. And um, God really blessed her in Chester. You know, at that time there were a lot of empty buildings uh, skating rinks and they used to be very popular but they'd fallen out of fashion in the 1880s and uh, so there's a lot of empty buildings like that and the Salvation took over, Salvation Army took over quite a number of those buildings including in Chester and so she took over one and uh, it was filled to capacity, 3,000 people but that wasn't big enough such as a move of God you know that um, she had to take on a second building so something like five, 6,000 people were affected by the the work of the Salvation Army in those days. So that was a real work of God also. There's another picture that's coming on your screen, and this is, uh, I got this from the war cry, and it was a, a huge meeting held in the Chester Town Square, and you can see that the, the crowds, you know, that were in that meeting there. So, so to answer your question, yes, uh, God has blessed Chester also very powerfully over the years. Your third booklet is entitled The People Who've Impacted Our Region. Could you tell us about some of the people who've made a special impact here? Yes, certainly. Um, as I mentioned before, God has raised up some quite amazing people uh, in Merseyside over the years, and um, I've written quite, uh, about quite a number of these, including people I've already mentioned, such as William Lockhart, uh, who's a Beckenhead evangelist who later went on to uh, establish Dr. Tabernacles, a well-known church in Liverpool. <coughs> and uh, although he was a layman, he had a congregation of 1,200 people, so he was, he was, uh, he was an amazing man. Also, Reginald Ratcliffe, who mentioned in the, one of the revivals in the Liverpool City Mission. Uh, people like John Hamilton, he was a brethren evangelist, um, God used powerfully not only in Liverpool, but in other parts of the country. Also, uh, people like Bishop Ryle, he was the first Bishop of Liverpool, uh, fervent evangelical, and he, he brought much blessing to Liverpool. So there was a, you know, there's a, a lot of people who have been a great blessing to Liverpool. Uh, one of them, as you can see his picture on the, uh, the cover of this booklet, is a man by the name of Alexander Balfour. Now, he was not a speaker, but he was a very wealthy Christian businessman. He did an immense amount of good for Liverpool. He supported a lot of Christian ministries so that people could operate in uh, evangelistic min uh, teaching ministry in many different uh, situations in Merseyside. And he was a really great man. And he was a man who was held in great affection. Um, if you go into St. John's Gardens, behind St. George's Hall, you'll see that there's a monument to him. And um, there was a book written about his life by a man called Reverend Lundy. And at the end of the booklet, he, this is the comment he made about him, which summed up his life. Liverpool 
that great community for which he so greatly pleaded daily till the day when he lay down to die. Liverpool was graven on his heart, like Jerusalem on the heart of the exiled Jews. To succeed to elevate, to bless Liverpool, was the consuming passion of his life. Great man. Another man I've written about who has been a, a real inspiration to me was a, a man named Canon Hobson. Now he, at one time, he was a curate of uh, Christ Church in Oxton, but he was asked to take on a, um, a new parish which was formed in Liverpool, and the back part of Liverpool known as Windsor, part of Tofton. And he took on the challenge, and at that time, uh, this, it was such a bad area that newspaper adverts would have uh, something containing uh, uh, people from Windsor need not apply. That's how bad it was. They didn't want people working for them who came from Windsor. That's how bad it was. And he took this on. And when uh, he started, there were only five members in the congregation. But he was, he was a, a man of great anointing in his ministry. He was a man of great prayer. And this, as I've mentioned before, is often a key factor to, to blessing on people's ministry. And, God's, um, and God certainly did bless his ministry. At the end of his ministry, he had no less than 3,000 people in his congregation. So he made a great impact on Liverpool. So there's many more I could tell you about. And uh, this is, uh, you know, as I say, it's, uh, there's a long list of people who God has really uh, greatly anointed and blessed in Liverpool. And um, this book is about many of those. The fourth booklet is entitled Inspiring Testimonies. Would you like to tell us about some of the people who have experienced God in a remarkable way? Yes. Over the years I've, I've got to hear about a lot of amazing testimonies. People who live in the Merseyside and Chester area or used to live and who are no longer with us. And I thought it would be a good idea to, to collect uh, a lot of these testimonies in one booklet. Uh, some of them are very inspiring. People who experience God in a, a most remarkable way, you know, in, in, in salvation, deliverance from drugs and alcohol and things like that. Also, people who have experienced remarkable healings and also people who have had angelic encounters. Uh, I'd just like to tell you briefly about two of those testimonies. Uh, you've seen the the cover of book four, there's a, a picture of a family, they're known as the Matthews family, Germany and Sajani Matthew. Now, they have a, a most amazing testimony, one of the most amazing testimonies I've ever heard in my life. They live in Upton in the world, they, they're both nurses, one works in Arrow Park Hospital and the other works in um, uh, Countess of Chester Hospital. And um, <coughs> this happened in 2000, 2007 and it was an amazing encounter and such that they, they weren't Christians at the time but as a result of that experience they both uh, were soundly converted and the, today they are going on well with the Lord and they're most delightful Christians, good friends of mine. Uh, another one I'd just like to mention briefly was my first pastor's wife, uh, Florence Burnham. Um, she, as a young girl, she had TB in both lungs. She had one was completely gone, the other was half, half gone. And um, God told her he's going to heal her. And he gave a picture of two new lungs. And she believed God. And, and one day the Lord just spoke to her and said, Get up or die. And she knew she had to do that. And she got up. Nobody would help her because they said, You'll kill yourself. And she says, No, God has told me. She got up. She dressed, had to dress herself, it took a long time, and she started to make her way out, and um, she took one step at a time, very painfully, but as she made each step, strength came within her, and then she ended up running, and that was a wonderful testimony. Uh, later on in her life, during the war, she, she had a very severe heart condition, and in which she was uh, taken around in a wheelchair during the whole of the war years, but God ra again raised her up. In the 1930s, they, she and her husband applied for missionary service, but they were turned down because of her appalling uh, health uh, record. But she lived, uh, you know, by God's divine power, and 
it, it's a, a, unbelievable but in 1970 they actually uh, they actually went out on the mission field and they both she was in the 60s and they went all around Africa there for 18 years and it wasn't in the nice parts it was in the, in the rough parts you know, in the bush and they only came back because of his ill health he was a big strong man you know and um, she lived until she was 91 years of age and it's a real testimony to God's amazing power so that's just two of the testimonies and there's other wonderful testimonies in that book Jeff, what is the purpose of writing about what God has done in the past and what is the relevance for us today? Yes, I, I believe it is relevant, very relevant because uh, firstly um, it's important to really know what God has done in the past. If you read the scriptures, you know, uh, God told the children of Israel to tell their children about all the wonderful things he had done in their past, such as all the signs and wonders when he brought them out of Egypt, and all he did for them going through the, the wilderness into the promised land, and all the great exploits of uh, you know, throughout their history. So it was import important for them, I believe it's important for us also to, uh, you know, to tell of what God has done in, in our own locality. I think secondly, it's, um, it is part of our Christian heritage and as such I, I believe we should value that you know, in, in that sense. Thirdly, when we consider all the tremendous things God has done in in our locality in the past. I believe it should really encourage uh, faith and expectancy that God will do it again. You know, it, God has not changed. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. And he's done, you know, people say that Liverpool is, or Merseyside is a really hard place, but and maybe that is true. But, you know, I would say that by virtue of the fact that God has done it before and such some some of these amazing things we've heard of today, then he's well and truly able to do it again. And I believe that the, the, the need is such, you know, our country is in a terrible state and um, I, I believe we should be seeking God for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And what he's done in the past, what he did in 1934 with the, those, uh, that, those wonderful meetings with Andrew Jeffries, I believe we should be asking God to do the same again for, in this generation. You know, those men, they serve God in their generation. I believe, you know, it is for us to serve God in our generation. And we should be looking to God to bring a fresh uh, move of God and a revival in our land. Um, you know, in Wales between 1750 and 1850, there was no less than 15 revivals. And whenever one revival was on the wane, the, the, the people of God would come together and they would earnestly seek God to, uh, to, to bring another revival. I know it's often said that a revival is, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an act of God and we can't do anything about it, but um, a sovereign act of God, we can't do anything about it. But you know, if we earnestly seek God, I believe God is not a disappointment. As I say, between it, during that period of 100 years in Wales, every time they came before God, they cried out to God and he, he, he kept on you know, bringing a fresh revival into, into, the, into the principality. So, you know, I believe that the needs of our country is such that... Um, that that is exactly what we should be doing today. This, this is what he wrote. And I think these words are very relevant. And I, I'd like these, this, this to, to go up on the screen. Unless we are favoured with frequent revivals and a strong, powerful work of the Spirit of God, we shall in great degree degenerate and have only a name to live by. Religion will soon lose its vigour. The ministry will hardly retain its luster and glory and iniquity will, of consequence, abound. If that doesn't sum up, you know, our present generation, I don't know what does. And so, you know, I believe we should really um, 
seek God for the fresh outpouring of his spirit. We should seek to uh, look to God to turn our country back again to being a God-fearing nation and um, a, a country uh, which was uh, as a um, stronghold of the Christian faith like it used to be. That's my prayer and that's what I believe. This is belief how we should be praying in, in these days. I'd like to thank Jeff for all that he shared with us today. And we, we've had an insight into the amazing and mighty things that God has done in this area. If you would like to know more about this, we would, you, you're free to contact the website and you could email or write him. All the information will be on the screen. We trust this has been a great blessing to you and we thank you for being with us today. Thank you.